Thank you. It's been said that everything that I needed to know, I learned by first grade. I'm sure everyone has heard that before. 20 years ago, just last month, I went on a journey to Cairo, Egypt. It is the land of history as well as the land of mystery. I spent a season working at a school for children suffering from Down syndrome. Upon my return to the United States, to the States, I began my journey as an educator. I started the school year as a high school social studies teacher. Over the next three years, I graded papers. I spent evenings talking to families on the phone whose children were suffering with sometimes learning disabilities or were just trying to get over that hump, whether it be academic or social. Three years into my time as a social studies teacher, I became an assistant principal. I was charged then with the responsibility of collecting data on our children, crunching numbers, trying to figure out what needed to happen in order to get our children in the city of Harrisburg at a higher level, a higher graduation rate, higher attendance. We spent millions of dollars on academic programming, on social programming, taking funds from the Department of Education as a means to get children ready for life after high school. We struggled, we had meetings, 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 one after the other, still with nary a result that we would consider successful. For example, there was a freshman class that came in at almost 1,100 students. In the four-year cycle of traditional high school, when it came time for those children to graduate four years later, the graduation numbers were 380. There was a 33% graduation rate. What did we do? We threw more money at a bad problem. Didn't change anything. Then something happened in 2005, late 2005, one of the many life-changing experiences I would have over the next 15 years. Uh, I was standing in the hospital at Hershey Medical Center, and my first child was born. Six months later, she entered daycare, or early childhood education. Shortly after her time attending her early childhood institution, I realized I was playing ball at the wrong end of the field. If you look at education in children almost like a plant, what you realize is that if you take the flower and compare it analogously to high school. Then you take the STEM and compare that to elementary school and middle school. There's one part of this plant that remains. It's an often overlooked aspect of child rearing and education. It is the root. The root is where everything begins. The root is where life begins. My title for my talk is Learning is Breathing. When my daughter was born, quiet in the room, a slight smack on the fanny from the physician, she began breathing. It was at that moment that I realized from her inception, she began to learn. And I realized then that I was focusing on the wrong end. I was paying attention to how do we take 10th grade students who are not achieving and turn them into high school graduates, send them off to college, get them ready for work, get them ready to go out into the world to be productive citizens. 
That is almost impossible. 10th grade is too late to begin this process. That was one of the life-changing experiences that I had had. And I thank God that my child was born because then the light bulb went off. I realized that I, my mission, needed to be at the other end. So a few years went by. I started conducting more and more research on early childhood education. There's a channel on television called Viceland. They say at the top of every show, if the system is failing you, you have no choice but to create your own. Our children were experiencing failure here in the city of Harrisburg. I took it upon myself. It became my personal responsibility, dealing with children that looked like me, black males, black females, who were coming from an underserved, high poverty, high minority subgroup population. I took the time and opened my own early childhood education center here in the city of Harrisburg, where we now have an enrollment of 92 beautiful, wonderful babies, a diverse population. What we have done within this program is we instill strong academics, cognitive development, strong food service, because we realize also that many of our children go home on the weekends and are not frequently fed as well as they do at our daycare center. We have some children who experience food insecurity at home. And it's not just the child, it's the entire family. But as all of us know, and in many circumstances, the children, the babies were the last ones to get fed. So many children would arrive to our daycare center on Monday mornings hungry. Some had not eaten since Saturday. And God forbid, some had not even eaten since Friday, since the last time they walked out of the door of my daycare center. We realized that we had to now provide additional foods to many of these families. And food insecurity just isn't about not having enough food to feed everyone or not having the accessibility of a grocery store across the street. What it also is about the foods that we're feeding our children. We had some three-year-olds that entered our daycare system. We have a family-style dining program where all the children sit at the table together. They have their plates, their forks, their spoons, their napkins, their cups in a very traditional manner. We had some children enter our system not knowing how to use either a fork or a spoon. Constant observation, constant analysis as to why this was happening. You begin to talk to the child, you interview the parents, and you realize that so many of our children, as it relates to food insecurity, were never having a home-cooked meal. They were eating from the local corner store bags of chips, bags of Cheetos, and of course, on every corner, and very close to my center within 200 yards, is a McDonald's. Processed, high fructose, sugary foods. Children were never learning to use a fork or a spoon because they were eating out of a bag. So what we decided to do was upgrade the type of food service that we were providing to the children. We upgraded the type of vegetables and fruits that we were offering. We also realized that Monday the children were coming in hungry, so we decided on Mondays for breakfast and lunch, we would provide twice as much food for the children, knowing that many were coming in with an empty belly. It took a while to realize that it was necessary in order to create a strong plant. We had to feed the root. We're at a point right now where we're satisfied with the wonderful things that have gone on. We've been able to work with the families. We've been able to work with the children. We had a particular child, if I can use as an example, and for the benefit of the program that we're experiencing, we'll name him Ted. <laughs> Ted was two years old when he ended our daycare system. 
Ted could not communicate verbally. Ted's only form of communication was physical. He hit, he spit, he kicked, he punched, and he screamed. When he couldn't communicate, he would beat his hands against his head. The staff said, Dr. Waters, why don't we perhaps talk to the parent and have him go somewhere else because we think he's disrupting the program. We said, no, we're not going to do that. I would not have wanted someone to do that to me or any of you out here in this lovely audience this afternoon. We contacted five different agencies throughout Dauphin County who were wonderful enough to provide support systems that were necessary for this child. Over the course of one year, we were able to reduce those five agencies to just one participating agency. I saw this child last summer at the grocery store uptown. He ran up to me, said, Dr. Waters, hi. Big smile on his face. He could now communicate. He was entering first grade. We took the time to nurture and feed the root. Had we not done that or have or other daycare centers choose not to do that, what you're doing is creating a negative structured system that is permeating America right now. That if we don't address the root causes of the problem, eventually that beautiful plant will turn into a weed and will take over our entire population, our community. And by then it becomes too late. As I said, this young man, Ted, I'm very proud. He's a perfect example of what can happen if we take the time and the energy and not look so far down the road at 10th, 11th, and 12th grade in the prom and where the children are at at that point because it is vital. Anyone that has a garden, anyone that's grown a vegetable or a fruit, you know it begins at the root. If you don't provide the rich soil, if you don't pay attention to it, if you don't plant the seeds correctly, your plant will not germinate, it will not grow, it will not be healthy. I'm not sure if anyone is aware, we have two different governing bodies in the state of Pennsylvania that oversee education. On one hand, there's the Pennsylvania Department of Education that oversees K-12 programming. We also have another governing body called the Department of Human Services, which is formerly called the Department of Public Welfare. They oversee child care programs. As I leave you today, I want you to think about, because I've often considered it the reappropriation of funds from the Department of Education where we're spending millions of dollars at the secondary level that could be moved into the Department of Public Welfare's pot in order to create better, strong, sustainable early childhood education programming. If you took just one-fifth of the millions of dollars spent on high school uh, life skills preparatory programs and placed them at the root before the plant even is exposed, I can assure you that that is not a dollar wasted. It is a commitment not to just education, it is a commitment to our babies, it is a commitment to our children, it is a commitment to our future. I believe in Harrisburg, I believe in this community, but we have to decide when and where we're going to nurture the plant. It begins at the root. Thank you.